Good morning. This is our midweek Bible study. We're returning after the holidays now and back in Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, this is a beautiful chapter of the Lord's grace shown to us through faith as we believe on him. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord, we thank you for this beautiful chapter of what, how you have changed our life. Lord, you, you've, you've brought us from death to life. Lord, you, you have um, promised for us. You have works that we should do after we believe on you. Uh, we have a, a glorious future ahead all part of the family of God. We thank you, Lord, for your word and your, your anointing today. Holy Spirit, speak this word to us in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll blow the shofar. In Ephesians chapter 2, uh, begins with a, a beautiful, beautiful word about grace. Uh, let's look at this first section of the chapter in verse 1, he says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, that everyone in the world who doesn't know Christ is walking according to the course of the world, according to their, their feelings, their flesh, their mind, rather than according to the Word of God. And it says he had made you alive. It's, it's interesting. It's a, lot of the, a lot of the different religions teach uh, about you need a you need a spiritual guide. You need somebody to show you the way and so on. But you know what mankind needs more than anything else? Before any teaching, before anything else, mankind needs to be made alive. We need to be brought from death to death and sin to life in Christ. So that's the most important thing that Christ has done for us. He's made us alive together with Him. Uh, through his work on the cross and the precious blood spilt for our sins. It says, in which you, according to, you once walked according to this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's another name for Satan. When, before you come to Christ and you're walking according to your flesh, according to the world, you're walking according to Satan's ways. And the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once, we, we all, once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. And so we, 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 we know that we came from that background. We came from a life of sin. We came up from a life of the flesh and the, 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 uh, the, the, the dictates of our mind rather than the Word of God. In verse 4, but God, but God, I love that phrase, but God, doesn't matter what, has happened, doesn't matter where you came from, doesn't matter uh, what sin, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he has loved us. Remember, remember John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised up together and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we, 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 are, we are changed. Our life is, we've gone from death to life in Christ and, and our whole position has changed. We sit together with him in, in the power of his resurrection and the power of his ascension and in that power of him sitting at the right hand of the Father, it says, we're made to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. That in the ages to come, verse 7, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in, the ki in, in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. There are glorious uh, promises and things that are going to be revealed and presented to us throughout the ages to come. Things that aren't even mentioned in the Bible uh, we have no idea all the wonderful things God has planned for those who have believed on his only begotten son. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We don't get saved by works. We can't save ourselves. We can't do good deeds. We can't do charitable works to get ourselves into heaven. It's it's, it's uh, by grace uh, it's, and through faith that you have been saved. 
But here's, look at verse 9. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. In verse 10, but we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What is that saying? We don't get saved by works, but once we become a believer after faith, after faith in Christ, he has works that he wants us to do. He's got a, a work, he's got a ministry for each of us to walk in, and he's planned that so that once we believe, then we walk in works that he has planned for us. It has nothing to do with gaining our salvation or gaining entrance into heaven. These works are, are designed for each believer in Christ after you come to faith. And then in verse uh, 11, another section of this chapter, we're brought near. We're brought near to God. We're brought near to each other by, by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens and com from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So he's talking about before Christ, uh, those that were Gentiles, those that were not walking according to the word of God, they had no hope. Now in Christ, both the circumcision and the uncircumcision, the Jew and the Gentile, become one as they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But now, in verse, uh, in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Brought near by the blood of Christ. It's the blood of Christ that reconciles us to God and reconciles us to each other, makes the Jew and the Gentile one once we all believe on him. For he himself, Christ is our peace. There's, there's so much turmoil in the world right now and people, are seek, people seek peace agreements and, and, and compromises and how can, we, how can we have peace? He himself is our peace. For he himself is our peace, verse 14, who, was, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of separation. So the separation between Jew and Gentile has been, has been brought down by the blood of Jesus, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of the commandments contained in ordinance so as to create in himself one new man. He, he, his intent... Is, see, God has ch two chosen groups of people. He has his chosen people, Israel, and his chosen people, the church. But his desire for eternity is for all to be one in Christ, all to be one in him. And from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. It's God's will, it's the Lord's will to put to death all separation, all division, and to bring us uh, to oneness to, together in Christ. And he came and preached, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and those who were near. He preached peace to the Jew and the Gentile alike. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Access to the Father is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and this is God's plan. If you, if you read the book of Revelation, it talks about the holy city uh, representing, representing the leadership of that holy city, the foundations and the gates. You have the apostles and you have the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's God's intention. This, this is, the holy city represents God's people, all of God's people together as one. For eternity, and that's God's plan. And and the only way you can come to come to be reconciled uh, with God and with each other is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is our cornerstone. It says now, as we as we wrap up this chapter, it says now. Therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. Saint, saints means holy people. So God's holy people. So whenever you hear that word saints, it doesn't mean a certain class of believer. It means everyone who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. But fellow, fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, 
<clears throat> when it says uh, household of God, it's, it's talking about his family. When you join uh, in faith with the Lord Jesus Christ, when you believe on the message of his salvation, you become part of the household of God or the family of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, it's talking about the original, the foundational apostles of the early church and, and prophets of that day. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He is the chief cornerstone on which the church is built in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into, into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. This, we, are, we, are the, we are the house of God. Uh, God doesn't need a temple in these last days. It's his intent that the church, that he would, he would abide in the church and the, the church would be his dwelling place. What is the church? Is it a building? No. Is it an organization? No. The church is the individual believers who believe on him. So he wants to dwell in us, not in a building, but in your heart. So we are the house of God. We are his dwelling place and we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We were talking about that last night in our new Bible study on the Holy Spirit. We began a Holy Spirit Bible study on Wednesday night every week. And uh, for a number of weeks, we'll be studying the person and the works of the Holy Spirit in the church. It's an exciting time. Oh, there's, there's turmoil all over the world. These are, the, these are those birth pains that Jesus talk, talked about that, that must come to pass before he returns. He's, he's come and he's coming again. He's coming back. And before he comes, all of these things that are going on, Jesus called them birth pains. They're going to get stronger and closer together. And then the trumpet's going to sound. The Lord's going to return for his people. God bless you. Join with us um, for Bible study again next Wednesday and uh, this Saturday for a, an encouraging message to the church. Our Lord, we come to you now. And we thank you for the glorious message of the gospel of Christ. Lord, that we're, not, we're no longer uh, people wandering the face of this earth without hope. And now that we have believed upon you, we become uh, the household of God. We become part of, the, part of your family, your holy family. We pray, Lord, your blessing over any today who are listening to this message that have not yes, yet confessed you as Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord, today with godly sorrow that they would confess, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm one of those sons of disobedience, and, and I want to believe on you. I want you to wash my sins away. I'm sorry for my sin, Lord. Forgive me my sins. Wash them away. And Lord, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I want to be the temple of God. I want to be the house of God, the place where you can dwell, Lord. And I pray for the church, Lord, that the people of God will understand. You don't go to church. You are the church. And that the people of God would begin to stop acting religious and, and ritualistic and be, become and really become the body of Christ. I pray, Lord Jesus, blessing over this message. Holy Spirit, deliver it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. So join us again Saturday for an encouraging message.